Welcome to B Main 610 Buddhist Ethics Department of Buddhist Chaplaincy University of the West. This is 2024 semester. Today I'm going to talk about the concept of Buddhist ethics. My name is Venerable Sumita or Bhante Sumita and I am the instructor of this course. And when it comes to seal or virtue or morality that is the very foundation uh, of buddhist spiritual journey sila is the pali word shila is the sanskrit word and that means virtue or morality and that is the cornerstone upon which the entire noble eightfold path is built i'm going to talk about it a little later in more detail and the noble eightfold path is further categorized into sila samadhi and panya sila means morality samadhi is concentration and panya means wisdom and out of them sila is the first step of this spiritual journey and right speech right action and right livelihood are the three factors of noble eightfold path that constitute this sila or morality or moral conduct or virtue and practicing buddhists voluntarily undertake particular set of training rules appropriate to their life situations let's uh, check what are those various kinds of seela or ethics that we have in buddhism for example every lay person men or women observe five precepts that is the very fundamental of being a buddhist if you want to be a buddhist you have to practice you have to observe you have to follow these five precepts so what we call pancha seela and lay people also once a month on a full moon day or what we also call uposatha day they observe eight precepts or even 10 precepts so they are extra three or five precepts so eight precepts is called atha seela 10 10 precepts are called dasa seela these are extra practices that uh, those buddhist people do for example in sri lanka every full moon day is a public bank and mercantile holiday so people can go to the temple freely without any problem so they free to go to the temple and mostly this wonderful opportunity is used by the elderly community where they find a much more peace and harmony on that particular day they can go to the temple and they practice eight seela or 10 seela the other people young people also observe eight precepts but mostly is the elderly community that prefer to go to the temple on a uh, full moon day somehow lay people have the opportunity to practice eight precepts on full moon day and novice monks and nuns that is uh, called samanera or samaneri in sanskrit that is shramanera or shramaneri they observe 10 precepts that is called dasa seela and the difference between lay people practicing 10 precepts and samanera or samaneri or novice monks and nuns practicing 10 precepts the difference is when a samanera or samaneri breaks any of those 10 precepts all the 10 precepts will be broken all the 10 precepts will be affected and shattered but in the case of lay people only that particular sealer that is broken will be considered broken and the other precepts are not broken so being a novice monk and nun is more challenging and they need to be more committed and more responsible to take care of their ten precepts and i remember when i was a novice monk we also had to observe these ten uh, precepts every week so once a week we observe ten precepts and we also are reminded that we have ten precepts to take care of so it's always constant reminder and repeating is a constant reminder for us to practice more meanwhile fully ordained monk or what we call bhikkhu in pali or bhikshu in sanskrit 
they have 227 rules to follow according to bhikkhu atimokha that is part of the vinaya pitaka code of conduct and fully ordained monk has 227 rules meanwhile a fully ordained bhikkhuni has 311 rules to follow according to bhikkhuni atimokha so you can see now lay people and monastic have very different lifestyles and how they are determined who is a lay person who is a monastic is determined on the basis of their practices so lay people can practice five precepts or 10 precepts or eight precepts and novice monks and nuns can practice 10 precepts and fully ordained monks and nuns they practice either 227 rules or 311 rules according to Vinaya Pitaka. So who is this Buddhist practitioner as we mentioned now? Now we know these five precepts, eight precepts and ten precepts are practiced by the lay Buddhist people. If you are a Buddhist, it is a must that you practice at least five precepts. and bhikkhu patimukh and bhikkhuni patimukh are the texts that prescribe all those rules and regulations for the fully ordained or full fledged monks and nuns meanwhile we also have something called dasa kusala or 10 wholesome deeds i will discuss a little bit about that little later and we have 10 perfections so dasa paramita and also the most important thing that we include this seal or ethics is noble eightfold path when you are into noble eightfold path that will lead you to the ultimate goal as a buddhist that is the supreme bliss of nibbana So this is the five precepts or pancha seela I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from killing living beings I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from taking things not given I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from sexual misconduct I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from false speech I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from distilled and fermented liquor that is drinks and drugs that causes intoxication or heedlessness if you take these five steps actually even though we call like this is the very foundation for all the buddhists but if you go through them carefully buddhist or non buddhist or anyone any human being can easily follow these five precepts and if you keep these five precepts intact your life will be such a meaningful and precious life that can be helpful to yourself and everyone else in the world so killing living beings reflects the fact that buddhism prescribes advocates about non-violence peace and harmony and complete no to the concept of killing so buddhism abstains completely from killing any sentient beings as we know there is a special meditation called metta meditation or loving kindness meditation which talks about immeasurable loving kindness boundless loving kindness and unconditional uh, loving kindness to all sentient beings all living beings so these are really powerful concepts in buddhism so this first precept to abstain from killing living beings is an indispensable part of a buddhist practitioner or buddhist ethical life and taking things not given is the second precept abstaining from taking things not given and there we also see how you work so hard for your own gain you work hard and you also respect other people when they work hard and their own prosperity their own property you respect other people when it comes to the first precept that we respect others life and when we consider about the second precept we respect others property and the third one is to abstain from sexual misconduct for lay people they of course they can get married they can have they can maintain their sexual life with their partners 
with their married people uh, that is perfectly all right but sexual misconduct means you are not going to interfere or intervene or mess up with others family life so it's very important that we respect others family life in order to maintain that beautiful healthy social life now you can see the carefully designed plan to have a wonderful peaceful and harmonious society where we can see coexistence and um, very healthy uh, relationships in the society when you respect others life when you respect others uh, property when you respect others family life they are all really powerful ethical codes for a healthy rich social life and abstain from forced speech is another precept that all the buddhists should uh, practice and this is the fourth precept to be honest to be sincere and to be truthful is one of the most powerful practices by all the buddhists it is said prior to attaining the buddhahood the the person who is aspiring to be a buddha is called bodhi sattva in theravada buddhism and during the whole span of his practice his fulfilling period his aspiring period as a bodhi sattva it is said that he has never ever told a lie so it is very important in buddhism to be truthful to be sincere and to be honest so the the fourth precept is really very powerful concept and very important practice for buddhist people and the fifth precept is to abstain from distilled and fermented liquor or drinks and drugs that causes intoxication or heedlessness now you can see this this uh, fermented liquor or drinks and drugs can lead some to intoxication and that can lead someone to heedlessness and that can also decline your own health and also it can be disastrous to your own life and also to the family members and everyone else in the society if you mess with this drinks and drugs thing and until recently we didn't have this drugs problem that much but today i think it's more than drinks it is the drugs that uh, menaces the young life and uh, millions of people in the world are addicted to drugs and they can get rid of it and they have lost their precious humanity human life and they have lost their aim lost their purpose of living and so it's very very unfortunate especially to see uh, the young children young generation getting addicted to this menace called drugs so it's very important that we are mindful of our association for example the school kids they should know whom they are associated with and they should know what are their friends leading them to and they should be very mindful and watchful all the time uh, what they do and whom are they living with it's really important and if you have a bad association you might be led to some of these unfortunate miserable situations in life where you can get rid of it it will be very hard once you are addicted to that so this particular seal of the fifth seal it is placed the fifth but if you go through this if you carefully analyze it once you break this seal that can lead to break all the other seals very easily all these five precepts are really powerful and really important and person who wants to follow buddhism if he or she practices this seela this ethical conduct their life can be very fruitful and very beneficial to themselves and also to everyone around so five precepts although it looks like just five but you can also see that these five precepts are really very important and everyone in the world in fact follow these five precepts without any difficulty and if they can do that they are contributing to the world peace harmony and peaceful coexistence in the world for a very healthy 
very prosperous and very peaceful world in the eight precepts apart from the five precepts we have three more and the third precept is replaced by the sexual activity i undertake the precept to refrain or abstain from sexual activity if you see in the five precepts he said i undertake to observe the precept to abstain from sexual misconduct so you can engage in sexual activity but you can't engage in sexual misconduct when you practice five precepts but here on a full moon day and that's why they do it once in a while and in that case you completely get rid of it refrain yourself from sexual activity and the sixth sealer is i undertake the precept to refrain from eating at the forbidden time normally afternoon they don't eat any food and the seventh sealer is the precept to refrain from dancing singing music going to see entertainments wearing garlands using perfumes and purifying the body with cosmetics so these are the other things that make your life more simple and humble and very down to earth so on a full moon day or a uposatha day when you go to the temple to observe eight precepts you do not engage in these things dancing singing music and entertainments and also wearing garlands or necklaces or chains or whatever and uh, you don't use perfumes and purifying cosmetics things you don't use on this particular day that day is the day you become more closer to the nature and you become more closer to the mother earth so it's really a very powerful practice and the eighth one is i undertake the precept to refrain from lying on a high or luxurious sleeping place so on a full moon day or an uposatha day when you practice eight precepts you become again even more humble and even more simple and you sit on the floor and you do not lie or sit on high or luxurious seats that is the eight precepts so when you see these uh, precepts for example the last three precepts if you eat something in the evening you are not breaking any civil law right and even though if you are going to attain any dancing singing music etc or using perfume or something purifying body cosmetics that doesn't really make you break the civil law of the country if you sit on a high or luxurious seat you are not going to break any seal so here you can see they are more extra precepts more intense practices in compared to those five precepts but the five precepts if you see like killing living beings can be a deadly deadly mistake if you do that you can be legally punished by most of the countries and taking things not given stealing also can be a very grave error or sin from your side so you should not do those sins and that can also be legally punishable offenses and the sexual misconduct can also be causing you into a lot of troubles a forced speech can be also disastrous distilled and fermented liquor drinks and drugs also can lead you to many other things if you by this temptation if you break other sealer so you can see the five precepts and the difference between the five precepts and the eight precepts now and the 10 precepts here like destroying living creatures taking that which is not given sexual activity incorrect speech intoxicating drinks and drugs which lead to carelessness eating at the forbidden time dancing singing music going to see entertainments wearing garlands using perfumes and beautifying the body with cosmetics lying on a high or luxurious sleeping place accepting gold and silver or money so these are the 10 precepts and here you can see in fact although it is called 10 precepts in comparison to the 8 precept we have only one extra precept here and that is the accepting gold and silver that is money and that is the extra precept that we practice when it comes to the 10 precepts and here the 8 precept 8 sealer 
you can see that the seventh one is broken into two here in the 10 precepts. That's why it is called 10 precepts. So actually, if we take eight precepts and you have only one extra precept, that is the last one, accepting gold and silver. And that is the difference between uh, five precepts and eight precepts and the 10 precepts. Right, and this is the other one I was talking about, Dasa Akusala or 10 immoral acts. And here we have three categories, what we call three Sankharas. And we have three sense doors. One is the body and the other one is our verbal faculty. And the third one is our mental faculty or the mind. So all the, the actions that we do, Actually, we use these three sense doors, either body or the, the mouth or the mind. And out of these three faculties, three sense doors, we can do any of these actions. For example, the three kaya sankara or immoral acts done with the body. Here we can see again, killing, stealing and sexual misconduct. And here also, you can see part of the five precepts are here. So the body is used to break these sealers and killing, taking what is not given or stealing and not just sexual misconduct, but also excessive use of sensual pleasures. And that is Kame Sumicha Chara. That can be related to not only sexual life, but also excessive use of getting addicted even to our other sense faculties like seeing or listening or sensing, smelling or even eating or tasting and contacting or touch. So these are the five other sense pleasures that we have. So if, if we excessively get addicted to any of these, that can also be a kamesu michachara in a way. So through the body, we do these three immoral acts, killing, taking what is not given, and sexual misconduct and excessive use of sensual pleasures. Vachi Sankara, or the immoral acts done with the speech, we have four of them. Lying, slandering, harsh speech, or frivolous talk. Lying is called Musa Vada in uh, Pali, and Slandering is called Pisuna Vacha in Pali and harsh speech is, is called Parusa Vacha in Pali and frivolous talk is called Sampapalapa in Pali. So lying is not telling the truth. Slandering is when you see some good people, you try to break them apart by telling, giving some wrong information or something. Harsh speech, you use some harsh words to, to hurt others and frivolous talks is mostly the unnecessary, unwanted uh, gossip that we talk about, which are useless mostly. So these are the four immoral acts done with speech. And then three immoral acts are done with the mind. That is Abhijja, Vyapada and Micha Ditti. Abhijja means covetousness, greed for others' belongings, or vyapada, ill will or hatred, and michaditi is wrong views. So we all have greed. We, it is natural that for all the human beings, like mundane human beings, average human beings, they decide, they have decided, and they, they have greed. But uh, when it comes to abhijja, that means you greet for others' belonging. It's not only your own belongings, but you are also, be, uh, you are yearning or uh, you are having a strong desire for others' belongings. That is called abhijja. And vyapada is the ill will of hatred. And this is also not just anger, but it is a little bit more a stronger version of that where you might be tempted to get revenge or revenge others or hate others or that can be a little bit more harsh or more disastrous in fact. And the wrong views, 
if you have wrong view everything else in the life can be different and you can be directed to completely a different path so it's very important that uh, we get rid of this wrong views we do have the right view samaditi so these are the three immoral acts done with the mind and this is called 10 immoral acts or dasa akusalas and then we have 10 perfections or dasa parami according to buddha vansa in kutaka nikaya and we have 10 paramis according to theravada buddhism as compared to six paramis in mahayana buddhism and dana parami is generosity or giving of oneself you know practicing generosity is the most important thing and everywhere in uh, buddhism they talk about this generosity it's a very very important and very very crucial part of buddhist practice a buddhist ethical life sila parami is virtue morality or proper conduct and nikkama parami is renunciation let it go you know you should be able to let it go and that is giving it up that is nikkama parami panya parami is transcendental wisdom insight or discernment where we actually gain by constant practice of mindfulness or loving kindness or any other form of contemplation meditation virya parami is the energy the diligence the vigor the effort so you need to make a lot of effort in order to achieve your spiritual goal so virya parami itself is another important step in buddhist ethical life and kanti parami is patience tolerance forbearance acceptance or endurance it is said there is no end to patience and when it comes to patience you should be able to be patient no matter what happens even at the cost of your life you should be able to be patient and not disturb your own inner peace so it's really again one of the most advanced practices by practicing buddhist such a parami is truthfulness and honesty as we already discussed how important it is to be honest and truthful because that itself is a parami or perfection and aditana parami again determination and resolution you are very firm and you are very strong in your determination uh, when it comes to your spiritual achievement so no matter what you will still continue to go ahead and work on that despite many ups and downs in life so aditana is another parami in buddhism metta parami good will friendliness and loving kindness again we will discuss a little more about this i am actually going to talk about this metta more in our meditation session so you can also learn more about that so metta means friendliness metta means immeasurable loving kindness love and compassion to all sentient being and this is boundless this is not discriminating anyone on the basis of the language or the gender or the culture or the country or the geographical area or religion or nationality or whatever that is absolutely above and beyond all those limitations and categories metta is a very very powerful practice by buddhist upekkha parami is the equanimity and serenity this needs much more advanced practice where you are not disturbed no matter what happens around your inner peace will not be disturbed because you are trained to train to live with it you can let it go and you can still maintain your inner peace no matter what happens and these are the noble eightfold path samaditi that is right understanding samma sankappa right intent samma vacha right speech and samma kammanta right action and samma ajiva right livelihood and samma vayama right efforts 
and samma sati, right mindfulness, and samma samadhi, right concentration. So here, right speech, right action, and right livelihood belong to the seal category. The first two, samma ditti and samma sankapa, that is right understanding and right intent, belong to the wisdom category, that is panya category. And the last three, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration belong to the samadhi or concentration category. This is the Noble Eightfold Path and we do have Sila, Samadhi, Panya as the further categorization of Noble Eightfold Path. Interesting analysis is here with regard to the, the virtue or the ethics in Buddhism. The Buddha said in this uh, Anguttara Nikaya 10.1 Sutta, there are virtues of reward. And Venerable Ananda, the personal attendant of the Buddha once asked the Blessed One, um, what of Venerable One is the reward and blessing of wholesome morality? What is the use of being morally good or what is the use of practicing? wholesome morality and the Buddha said freedom from remorse Ananda. So when you practice morality you will be free from remorse. That is a remarkable reward. And then Venerable Ananda further asks and of freedom from remorse and from there what? And then the Buddha said joy Ananda. So freedom of freedom from remorse and then it is the joy and from joy, it is the rapture. And from rapture, it is the tranquility. And from tranquility, it is the happiness. And from happiness, it is the concentration. And from concentration, it is the vision and knowledge according to reality. From there, you can go to turning away and detachment. And from turning away and detachment, the vision and knowledge with regard to the deliverance, that is the Nibbana or the enlightenment. And you can see now this beautifully interconnected flow of spiritual path. So when you start with the sealer, you can go all the way up to the final goal, that is the Nibbana, according to this sutta. So the Buddha talks about that. For example here, Happiness leads to concentration. So when you are so much happy and you are so, so tranquil in your mind, it is so easy for you to concentrate. If you are troublesome, if you are restless, it will be difficult for you to concentrate. So these are all interrelated, mutually helpful to each other. And then we also have, according to Abhisandha Sutta of Anguttara Nikaya, there are five faultless gifts and these five faultless gifts are very, very important because they are original, they are long-standing, traditional, ancient, unadulterated, unadulterated from the beginning and they are not open to suspicion. They will never be open to suspicion and they are unfaltered by knowledgeable, contemplative Brahmins. So Brahmin here in the sense they are the practitioners, those so wonderful spiritual practitioners, they will always appreciate these five gifts. What are those five gifts? Again, we come to those useful or familiar five precepts. Abandoning the taking of life, abstains from taking life. So that is the first one. And the second faultless gift is abandoning, taking what is not given, that is stealing. And the third faultless gift is abandoning illicit sex or sexual misconduct. And the fourth faultless gift is abandoning lying or false speech. And then the fifth faultless gift is abandoning the use of intoxicants. Now you can see very easily according to this Sutta, Abhisandha Sutta, we can see those five precepts. When you practice five precepts, there are faultless gifts. How can they become faultless gifts? 
and the first precept, for example, first gift. There is the case where a disciple of the noble ones abandoning the taking of life abstains from taking life. In doing so, he gives freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings. In giving freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, freedom from oppression to limitless numbers of beings, he gains a share in limitless freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, and freedom from opp oppression. This is a beautiful analysis of practicing five precepts according to Abhisandha Sutta. So when you respect others' life, hear what happens. You actually give freedom to other people because they have a sense of security and you give that insurance, you give that assurance to them, your life is safe and you will not be harmed by me. You are free from danger. You are free from animosity. You are free from oppression by me. So when you give that assurance to limitless numbers of beings, what happens in return? Your life also be safe. You will be free from danger, free from animosity, free from oppression. So you can see not only human beings, but also even the animals. You can see when you love the animals, how they love you very easily. They feel that vibration. They feel that positive, wonderful, spiritual energy in you. They can sense it. So when you give that assurance, your life also will be protected. So when you respect others' life, others will also respect your life. And that is a faultless gift. That is the first faultless gift. And similarly, when it comes to the, the stealing, abstain from taking what is not given, when you practice this sealer and you give an assurance to others, the freedom from danger, freedom from animosity, freedom from oppression, and when you don't steal, other people feel more safe and out of danger and out of animosity and out of oppression. So when they feel that insurance, they feel that assurance, they feel that sense of security regarding their property and you will gain the same thing in return. Your property will be protected. Your property also will be out of danger. And this is the, the second faultless gift according to Abhisandha Sutta. The third faultless gift is abstaining from illicit sex or sexual misconduct. When you do that, you also give freedom from danger, animosity and oppression to everyone else because you practice. You practice abstaining from illicit sex or sexual misconduct and that way you respect others' family life. When you respect others' family life, in return, the others also respect your family life. You are protected. And that is the, the wonderful faultless gift according to Abhisandha Sutta. And the, the fourth faultless gift is abstain from lying. And when you don't tell lies, when you are truthful and sincere and honest, and you also give assurance to others, freedom from danger, animosity and oppression. And that way they feel more secure, more comfortable, more safe in dealing with you. Let's say you are a business people and when they know that you are truthful, you commit yourself to, the, to your promise and you don't break your promise. And there the trust starts to build and then you can of course, improve your business, right? And even in our, in our daily life, when we are truthful, other people will start, definitely will start respecting you for that wonderful quality. You don't have to be rich for that. You can even be a very simple person, humble person. And when you are a truthful person, 
other people will feel that good energy in you and they will respect you same thing uh, in return you see that wonderful faultless gift and you are free from danger animosity and oppression because of your truthfulness and the fifth faultless gift is when you practice abstaining from taking intoxicants you also give assurance to others the freedom from danger animosity and oppression and when you do that others also will give you that in return in manifold ways in fact so your life will also be free from danger animosity and oppression this is a really really wonderful way to analyze the five precepts and you can also see the five precepts are actually taught in the original suttas like this so when we have these five faultless gifts this is the the reward of merit and reward of skillfulness and nourishment of happiness celestial resulting in happiness leading to heaven leading to what is desirable pleasurable and appealing to welfare and to happiness all these are part of our peace and happiness and good health and safety and all this stuff because you practice five precepts now you know the importance of practicing five precepts and the unassailable gift that you can earn by practicing these five precepts the faultless gifts according to anguttara nikaya abhisand sutta according to moolu posata sutta in anguttara nikaya buddha talks about eight precepts and here we have slightly different but more or less the same one should not kill a being or take what is not given should not tell a lie or be a drinker or a, a of strong drink should abstain from unsalibacy the sexual act should not act eat at night the wrong time of day should not wear a garland or use of scent should sleep on a pallet or mat spread on the ground for this eight factored uposatha has been proclaimed by the awakened one to lead to the end of the suffering and stress now you can see why these are important because they actually lead us to the the end of our suffering end of our stress and it will lead us to the the final goal that is the nibbana so the eight precepts are again really very important practices in buddhist ethics and uh, muluposatha sutta also talks about gives this beautiful um, two sentences two poems the moon and sun both fair to see shedding radiance wherever they go and scattering darkness as they move through space brighten the sky illumining the quarters so you when you practice this seela you actually illuminate the entire world within their range is found well pearl crystal bell lucky gem platinum nugget gold and the refined gold called hataka yet day so when you practice this seela these are the material benefits you become prosperous person as well and you will be showered with lot of material benefits here when you practice seela it's it's an interesting analogy again according to anguttara nikaya moolu posata sutta like the light of all stars when compared with the moon and worth 1/16th of the eight factored uposatha so you might get a lot of money you will be very rich but it is nothing compared to the practice of eight precepts said it is an worth 1/16th of uh, the eight factored uposatha so whoever man or woman is endowed with the virtues of the eight factored uposatha having done meritorious deeds productive bless beyond reproach goes to the heavenly state so goes to the heavenly state that is the absolute peace and 
happiness that is Nibbana. And again here in Diganikaya, Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the last day Sutta Buddha is explained here. Then in Diganikaya we have long discourses. In fact, in Diganikaya it's part of the Sutta Pitaka. There are 32 suttas and Mahaparinibbana Sutta is a very popular one. Here in this sutta, it is discussed about the Buddha's last few days. And there are five blessings according to this sutta. Five blessings householders accrue to the righteous person through his practice of virtue. When you practice sila, when you practice your ethics or moral conduct, you will get five blessings. What are they? One, great increase of wealth through his diligence. So... This is more of a material gain. You become rich. When you practice sila, you become rich. And the second one, a favorable reputation. You will also gain good uh, name and fame. That again is another mundane achievement. And the third one, a confident deportment without timidity in every society, be it that of nobles, brahmans, householders or ascetics. Here you can see a little different, but you become much more confident wherever you go because of your sila, because of your practice. When you are honest, when you know what you practice, when you are confident about your practice, you can be very confident wherever you go. You really improve your self-confidence very greatly when you practice sila. And then the, the fourth one is serene death. A lot of people, they are very restless when it comes to the dead and they become very scared and they don't want to die and they somehow want to retain their life and they struggle a lot, they suffer a lot, they undergo a lot of miserable experiences. But the one who practices sila will have very serene, and peaceful death. This is a really important, again, blessings. And then the last but not the least, at the breaking of the body after death, rebirth in a happy state in a heavenly world. So if that person, the virtuous person, the morally rich person, if that person dies at the breaking of the body, he will be born in a more happier, more comfortable life more comfortable realm or rebirth in a heavenly world. So these are the five blessings according to Mahaparinibbana Sutta. When you practice Sila, you also have these five blessings. According to Mahanama Sutta of Anguttara Nikaya, we also have recalling your own virtues. You can contemplate, you can reflect, or you can retrospect your own sila. You can look back into your own sila or virtues or moral conduct. And that way you will also be benefited or much more. And so according to the sutta, it is said, furthermore, there is the case where you recollect your own virtues. And these sila or these virtues are untorn, unbroken, unspotted, unsplattered, liberating, praised by the wise untarnished and conducive to concentration. If you have these things, it is of course very easy for you to meditate. Very easy for you to meditate. That's why those practitioners of meditation, for example, if they are lay people, they observe five precepts or eight precepts or ten precepts and that way their sila can help them gain peace and harmony and happiness and then their mind is able to concentrate more intensely. According to the Sutta, at any time when a disciple of the Noble One is recollecting virtue, this is called Sila Anusati. His mind is not overcome with passion. When he does that, his mind becomes very detached and not overcome with aversion, very kind and not overcome with delusion, everything is very clear to that person. So his mind heads straight and based on virtue. These are some of the benefits of Sila Anusati. 
and according to mahanama sutta it, it further says when the mind is headed straight the disciple or the the noble one gains a sense of the goal gains a sense of the dhamma and gains joy connected with the dhamma all these are interconnected again he or she recollects the virtue and then he so her mind when it is not overcome with passion not overwhelmed with aversion or delusion what we call raga dosa moha passion aversion and delusion when we are away from that free from that our mind becomes straight and because of that virtue and morality then it is easier you feel you can sense your spiritual goal you can sense also the dhamma and you can of course sense that joy it will be connected with the dhamma in one who is joyful rapture arises in one who is rapturous the body grows calm and one whose body is calm experience such ease so when your body is calm it is more easy and more comfortable in one at we ease the mind becomes concentrated so you see these are actually interconnected your mind has to be head straight and then you also needs to sense the goal and the dhamma and then you are joy connected with the dhamma and when you are joyful the rapture arises when you are rapturous the body grows calm and when the body goes calm you feel more ease when you are at ease then it is easier for you to concentrate you now you can see that logical sequence here and according to sikha sutta pangutra nikaya there are four types of individuals and they practice the precepts and support others practice too so that is one thing okay here we talk about the one who practices for his own benefit but not for that of the others there are people like that they they practice for themselves not for the others there are some other people who practices for the benefit of others but not for his or her own that's another side of the coin and then there are people the one who practices neither for his benefit no for that of the other so there are some people who practice who do not practice for the benefit of himself or the others and the, the fourth category is the opposite the best and the one who practices his own benefit and for that of the others now you can see the different categories different types of individuals and we also should uh, be able to recognize identify them and learn from such people we can also be careful in determining these people for example if somebody is practicing for the benefit of uh, is so her own self and not supporting others then you should know what kind of a person is that and then there are some other people who do not care about themselves but care about others benefit and then also still not really balance and the extremely negative person would be the one who practices neither for his own benefit nor for that of the others and this is the best person in the world for you to be associated with that is the one who practices for his own benefit and for that of the others according to anguttara nikaya sikha sutta so how is one an individual who practices for his own benefit but not for that of the others how does it happen so what happens here he himself abstains from the taking of life but doesn't encourage others in undertaking abstinence from the taking of life is very good he or she practices individually but they do not encourage other people to avoid the killing and he himself abstains from stealing but does not encourage others in undertaking abstinence from stealing 
He himself abstains from sexual misconduct, but doesn't encourage others in undertaking abstinence from sexual misconduct. He himself abstains from lying, but doesn't encourage others in undertaking abstinence from uh, lying. He himself abstains from intoxicants that cause heedlessness, but doesn't encourage others in undertaking abstinence from intoxicants that cause heedlessness. Now you can very easily see this person is really a wonderful practice anyway. You know, at no point we want to say that this person is a bad person, but this person is compared to the real good practitioner should be different from this. Although it is good for that person, if he or she practices alone and uh, maybe not interested or maybe tired of sharing it with others or things like that can happen, then these people can be more individual and not really wanting to share those things with the others, maybe due to many reasons. Maybe you're not um, interested because you feel like it's not going to work or it's useless to make so much effort to help others. So at least if you practice for yourself, it will be so much better too. And so the other person who practices for the benefit of others but not for his own, there is the case where a certain individual himself doesn't abstain from the taking of life but encourages others in undertaking abstinence from the taking of life. Here actually we see someone who doesn't follow his by example but he or she really promotes this idea of non-violence, peace and harmony. So they promote that idea in so many different ways. Similarly with the precepts on stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and intoxication, this is the same way how they practice but they do not really encourage other people. Here in the second category, they do not practice, but they encourage other people to practice these five precepts. The other person, the worst person, is the one who neither practices, who practices neither for his own benefit, nor for that of the others. And such people abstain from taking of life. Uh, There is the case where a certain individual himself doesn't Uh, abstain from the taking of life and doesn't encourage others in undertaking abstinence from the taking of life. You can see now, similarly with the the other process, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying and intoxicant, they neither practice themselves nor encourage anyone to, to practice. There are people like that. Now you learn three categories of people and now we have to also be very careful about such people and the best one we should select we should be benefited when we have the association with such good wonderful friends there is the case where a certain individual himself abstains from the taking of life and encourages others in undertaking abstinence from the taking of life so now not only you avoid yourself from killing or harming others but also you avoid you do not allow other people around to be engaged in such acts so that is the kind of wonderful kalyana mitra friends good friends spiritually rich friends that we should have in our life same thing with the stealing sexual misconduct lying and intoxicant not only they avoid themselves from such things but also they would take care of their friends and relatives and close ones. So they make sure that the other party also is safe and protected according to Anguttara Nikaya Sikha Sutta. I really want to t- talk about this one, conditions of worldly progress, that is admirable friends. They encourage the development of virtue and they really important players of our ethical, moral conduct. That is the accomplishment of persistent effort. There are four kinds of conditions. One, accomplishment of persistent effort, what we call Uttana Sampada. Second one, the accomplishment of watchfulness, that is Araka Sampada. Third one, 
good friendship, Kalyana Mitata, and the fourth, Samajivikata, that is the balanced livelihood. When you have this Uttana Sampada, Araka Sampada, Kalyana Mitata, and Samajivikata, your life becomes much more progressive. Here, especially, the importance of good friends in one's life can lead to safety, protection, and good moral, ethical conduct. According to Anguttara Nikaya, Digha Janu Sutta O Vyagha Pajya Sutta, Vyagha Pajya Sutta, conditions of welfare. These wonderful friends, these admirable friends or Kalyana Mitra friends, what is the meaning uh, of Kalyana Mitra? There is the case where a lay person in whatever town or village he may dwell, spends time with householders or householders, sons, young or old, who are advanced in virtue. He talks with them, engages them in discussion. The wonderful Kalyana Mitra friends, not only he practices, but also talks with uh, the other people and try to help them. He emulates consummate conviction in the principle of karma in those who are consummate in conviction. So this, uh, this is called sadha. So sadha is another very important property that one can have. The second one is the consummate virtue in those who are consummate in virtue. Sila, sila sampada, sadha, sila. And then the other one is chaga and then panya. Chaga is consummate in generosity and panya is consummate in discernment. So these four, these four factors are important for finding a good admirable friendship according to Vyagha Pajya Sutta. So you can determine whether your friend is consummate in conviction, consummate in virtue, consummate in generosity and consummate in discernment. If you know if you recognize these qualities in a good friend, you should never leave such people. You should be able to get more and more closer to such wonderful, admirable friends for the benefit of your own spiritual goal. And in order to do that, according to Theravada Buddhism, in our day-to-day -day practices, we use this wonderful Pali stanza. This is like a mantra. When we practice this, we keep our palms together, close to our heart, and we repeat this Pali stanza word by word with very concentrated mind. And then when we keep reciting this every day, it is said, you will never be in short of wonderful good friends, admirable friends, Kalyana Mitra friends in your life, wherever you are, Whenever you need some help, you will always get some wonderful friends. And this stanza is the powerful mantra that you can also practice every day if you want some good, admirable friends and Kalyana Mitra friends. That is, Imina Punya Kang Mena Mame Bal Samagamo Satang samagamu hutu yavanimbana patiya. By the power of this merit, may I never be associated with foolish people. May I always be associated with good, spiritually rich friends until I achieve the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Imina punya kamena means by the power of this merit. Ma me bal samagamo means may I never be associated with foolish friends, foolish people. Satang samagamo hotu means may I always be associated with good, spiritually rich friends. Yav nibbana patya as long as. I achieve my own liberation, my own Nibbana. May I always be associated with wonderful, admirable friends, wonderful Kalyana Mitra friends in my life. If you keep praying, 
you will always get them in your life you will meet them no matter what no matter where you are you will find them somehow when you are in need of such good friends okay i think uh, with that we conclude for today and thank you for joining us i hope you learn something more about the buddhist ethics and the importance of buddhist ethics and if you need more help you can always contact me this is our information contact number and thank you for joining us that's it for today and see you again wish you all a wonderful week ahead